happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's case was recommended by Mrs. Brain Scratch and is called Chasing a Story. Martin Luther King Jr. said, All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. Journalist Kim Walls' work embodied this notion. Born in 1987 in Trelleborg, Sweden, she studied international relations at the London School of Economics before becoming admitted to the master's program at Columbia University School of Journalism. Kim was smart and well-traveled with a wide variety of interests. Her subject matter was less from the mainstream media and aimed more at stories that highlighted people and situations that were considered to be outside of the norm. Some of her specialties were stories about identity, gender, or subcultures. Her award-winning articles took her through hostile environment training before she snuck into North Korea. She also willingly traveled to the Marshall Islands to show former nuclear testing sites while risking her health and safety in the process. Her mother, Ingrid, said, quote, what made her journalistic ability so exceptional was that she looked for quirky stories, but with a bigger narrative. She reported them deeply. She never made a spectacle of the characters. Her reporting was rock solid. On August 10th, 2017, she and her boyfriend, Ol Stobe, were getting ready to move from Copenhagen, Denmark to Beijing, China. And that evening, friends were throwing them a going away party. As she prepared herself for the night's activities, she received a text message. Danish inventor Peter Madsen asked if she was interested in interviewing him. For months, Kim had tried securing an interview with the man, who was a minor celebrity in Copenhagen. Madsen was an inventor who built his own 40-ton submarine in 2008. He offered the interview and a ride in the submarine, the UC-3 Nautilus. She was excited about the opportunity and after talking to Ole, decided to interview Madsen and miss some of the party. The plan was to interview Madsen during a two-hour ride in the Nautilus that would take place between 7 and 9 p.m. Ole received several text messages from her during that time, one of which said, I'm still alive, by the way, but I'm going down now. I love you. Moments later, she added, he brought coffee and cookies, though. Kim didn't return to the dock at 9 p.m. as planned. Ole tried texting her several times without getting any response. By 1.45 a.m., he contacted the police. Officers feared that the submarine had sank and that the two could be trapped underwater. An extensive water search was started. At 10.30 a.m. the next morning, the sub was finally sighted. A rescue helicopter radioed Madsen, but before they could get any details out of him, the sub sank within a matter of seconds. A nearby fishing boat was able to pull Madsen from the water. He was then taken by police to the nearby port of Dragor, where they met with reporters. When Madsen was asked what had happened, he replied that he had taken the sub for a test drive, then a valve on the ballast tank malfunctioned, causing the sub to sink. He was then asked, where was Kim Wall? He replied that he had dropped her off the night before at about 12.30 near the Hall Vandit restaurant. Until Kim's whereabouts could be ascertained, Madsen was taken into custody. The area that the restaurant was located in was completely covered in cameras, and when CCTV footage was checked, it showed no Kim and no Madsen. When Madsen was confronted with this by investigators, he began to tell a different story. He now claimed that a terrible accident had occurred and that a 150-pound sub hatch had fallen on Kim's head as she entered the sub. Not knowing what to do, he dumped her body into the Coag Bay, about 30 miles away. Madsen was arrested and charged with involuntary manslaughter. Swabs were taken from his body, and his clothes were confiscated. Eleven days after his arrest, a cyclist riding near the shore of a lake in the capital region of Denmark found a human torso washed up on the beach. DNA testing would show that it belonged to Kim, and her remains would tell a very different story. Her torso showed 15 stab wounds and signs of sexual assault. 
It was also clear that the missing parts of her remains had been removed with a saw blade, but they were nowhere to be found. When Madsen was confronted with these details, he changed his story again. He now claimed that Kim had suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning in the engine room and died while he was on deck. He had dismembered her body because he was unable to carry it out of the ship to give it a burial at sea. Investigators now had the daunting task of searching a large area for the rest of Kim's body. For 56 days, searchers looked in the area where the torso had been found before they came up with a very unique way of finding Kim. Oceanographers Torben Vang and Morton Holdegard Nielsen knew how to chart where objects would move within a current. Using this technique, they narrowed down the search areas substantially. Near the end of the year, Swedish cadaver dogs were brought in that could smell decomposition underwater. It was the first time these types of dogs had been used in Denmark. The dogs narrowed the area even further. Soon, the rest of Kim's body had been found in bags, bags that were weighed down with pieces of metal. More forensic analysis would find no signs of carbon monoxide poisoning and no trauma to her head as described in the falling hatch story. Although reports vary as to the exact spot, Kim's clothes were also found. Some reports are saying that they were in the sub, while others are saying that they were also weighed down with metal and found near the rest of her body. Investigators that processed the swabs taken from Madsen discovered that Kim's blood was literally on his hands, in his nostrils, and on his clothes. Her blood had also been found in the submarine. At no time during all of this did Madsen admit to murdering her or assaulting her. At his trial in March of 2018, the prosecution showed that on the day of the murder, Madsen had asked three other women to take a ride in his submarine. Kim was the only one that accepted. When Madsen's friends were questioned, they claimed that he was a narcissist who was very hard to work with. They also claimed he was fascinated with sexualized violence. On his computer, investigators found videos that backed up those claims. One ex-girlfriend showed text messages where Madsen outlined his plan to murder a woman. When Madsen testified for himself, he would switch, prefer referring to himself in the third and first person, as well as using present and past tense. He claimed that he had lied to investigators in the beginning to save Kim's parents from knowing how gruesome her death was. He also claimed that he watched videos of women suffering to bring out his empathy and, quote, tendency to always root for the underdog. On April 25th, 2018, Madsen was found guilty of premeditated murder, aggravated sexual assault, and desecrating a corpse. He was sentenced to life in prison, a sentence that isn't handed down very often in Denmark for the murder of a single person. He was also ordered to pay Kim's boyfriend about 20,000 US dollars and he had to pay for the disposal of his submarine. Kim's parents, Joachim and Ingrid, will always feel the loss of their daughter, and so will the world. They stated that they were surprised that her death had occurred just kilometers from her childhood home and not abroad in some far-flung part of the world. Her friend and classmate, Anna Codrea Rado, asked that everyone not remember her as the murdered Swedish journalist who died in a grisly horror straight out of a crime drama. Remember her work. Case cracked. I would like to thank RollingStone.com, RememberingKimWall.com, Esquire.com, NPR.org, The New York Times, Ranker.com, Wired.com, BBC.com, and Cinemaholic.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case. And here she is now to discuss it with us. Christy, from what I'm seeing, we have a woman who is incredible. She's brave. She takes all these amazing risks in her life and then survives all that. And her life is ended due to meeting just a terrible person. It breaks my heart. I mean, with everything that she offered the world and... I just, it's unbelievable. And what's almost, almost more unbelievable to me is Peter Madsen. Like if you look into his backstory and stuff, this is a guy that he could have been like an Elon Musk type. It's like he, but he's a step away from that. And it's a very big dramatic step. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, He's almost a straight up super villain. Yeah. Tell us more about him. What, what did this guy well, do? At the age of 15, he developed his own rocket fuel. I mean, I'm not going to argue that he's not smart. He is smart. Yeah. After that, he continued to practice engineering on his own independently because he never finished any formal education. But mm. somehow he still found people to fund all of these endeavors. You know, uh, he started his own rocket Madsen space lab where he works on the rockets. Right. After he learned about submarines, he built his own. He ended up, like you said, he built three of those before he was done. Three submarines. Guy has his own rocket space lab. I'm like, what? It's unbelievable to me that, like, if you're so into that, like you're so into engineering and think of the time, I mean, for you to build three submarines, but then you've got this other side of his personality. According to Wikipedia, it says he's also a regular in fetish groups. Mm -hmm. He was married, but had an open relationship. Uh, with mm-hmm. someone that I believe that worked in the film industry that continued until 2018 when his wife seemingly abandoned him. Uh, mm. And by the way, she isn't named in any of this stuff. Um, no. Yeah. No. It's unbelievable. She's the lucky one, I think. Sounds like it. Yeah. Or the smart one, maybe. I don't know. That's... I don't know either. Mm. But I mean, his supervillain ways continued after he got arrested. So it's he's not learned any lessons. He hasn't stopped here. Okay. In October of 2020, Copenhagen West Regional Police confirmed that Madsen had escaped prison. <laughs> this guy. Okay. It never it never ends, and it's always go big or go broke, I guess. Yeah. They found him less than a mile away from the prison. He had an object that looked like a pistol, and he was wearing a belt that looked like it had explosives on it. So that got him out of the prison. But when bomb experts arrived on the scene, they looked at it and they were like, no, that's not a bomb at all. So they just arrested him again. Once again, just Mm -hmm. showing a level of intelligence, man, just apply it in a positive way that wants to benefit other people. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if you saw a device like that strapped around this guy's waist, knowing that, oh, he invented his own rocket fuel at the age of 15, yeah. would I be concerned that even in jail, that he didn't pull together some type of mechanism and be able to build that himself? Like, yeah, I that's a reality. Totally believe, yeah. yeah, I totally believe he could do that. So I get that. And, you know, obviously you have to treat it that way. I'm thankful that they were able to identify that it was a fake and uh, Me too. bring him in again. So well, what happens with that when they do bring him in? Well, and he just tacked on more time is all he did, really. Mm. The Copenhagen court handed down a 21-month sentence to run with his life sentence for the attempted escape. Yeah, obviously, it's no no big difference if he's already serving a life sentence. But What I found kind of funny is that he's been ordered to pay $3,200 to a psychologist. He threatened the man's life on the way out of the prison during his escape. So now he has to pay him. Wow, wow. <laughs> uh, that, that was my one happy thing here yeah yeah well and outside of that uh he also wound up dating a female prison security guard i just i don't know how that keeps happening we we had a big one of those in the news this past year as well mm-hmm. but we've talked en- enough about him what about kim's family and her legacy what's happening around that well kim's family is helping to spread her legacy even after her death A remembrance page that we mentioned, rememberingkimwall.com, has been established, and it tells everyone about her life, her work, everything. And they set up a memorial fund. Now, the memorial fund says the grant will fund a young female reporter to cover subculture, broadly defined, and what Kim liked to call the undercurrents of rebellion. Mm -hmm. They've raised over $400,000 so far. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that that could really help uh, change journalism in, in a significant way and inspire yes. journalists for years and years and years. That's really, really awesome. Yes, it is. Uh, if you guys are interested to learn more about this story, there is an HBO series about Kim's death. It's called The Investigation, I believe. It's not in English. It is subtitled. 
Mrs. Brain Scratch could not stop watching it. She actually <laughs> powered right through it. There's also a documentary called Undercurrent, The Disappearance yes. of Kim Wall. So you guys can check that out too. Christy, Both very good. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your work and help on this. We really appreciate you. Mm -hmm. I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporter Amanda Beard. For over six years, we've always run limited commercial ads here on YouTube, and we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Candace Allison recently did. We know that learning about how justice is found in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover. And we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, don't forget to subscribe below and hit that bell icon if you want to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel. <laughs>